Now, tell the audience, in case they're just joining us, what chapter we've turned to in the scriptures. Genesis 32, 32, and I'm going to start reading in a portion that follows the Jacob narrative. If you've ever studied Jacob, he is one of the most fascinating individuals in all the Old Testament and certainly in the book of Genesis. And so we're picking up in the middle of his narrative. We're picking up at a place where God has come to him um, through a, a vision and told him or had his voice speak over him, it is time for you to go back home. He has been on the run at his uncle's house, Laban's house, for 20 solid years because out of his trickery, he cheated his brother Esau not only of his birthright, but also of his father's blessing. And the last he saw his brother, his brother threatened to kill him. So his mother sends him off to her brother where he stays now for 20 solid years and where he has also acquired not one wife, but through trickery, Two wives. This time the trick was done to him instead of by him. And that is the way the narrative goes. And so we pick up in Genesis 32, verse 1, as he is on his way back to the land of promise that has been given to his forefathers for him to take. And it says in verse 1, Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp. And so we called the name of that place. Mahanahim. And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the country of Edom, instructing them, thus you shall say to my Lord Esau. This is Jacob telling them what to say to Esau. Thus says your servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed until now. One version says, I've been detained all of these years with Laban. I have oxen donkeys, flocks, male servants, and female servants. I have sent to tell my Lord in order that I might find favor in your sight. Verse 6, and the messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau and he is coming to meet you. And there are 400 men with him. And it says, then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. He divided the people who were with him and the flocks and herds and camels into two camps thinking, okay, if Esau comes to one camp and attacks it, then the camp that is left will escape. Picture this with me as he prepares to meet his brother who has a murderous vengeance toward him. I want you to just go with me onto this page as we open up into this narrative where something has happened that is classic in so many of us as people of faith. We see Jacob fighting for a blessing that he has already received. I mean, it's just, it's truly so intriguing because God spoke over the children in the womb of their mother when they were wrestling and turning. And she said, the younger one will be Lord over the older one. He will take the authority. It had already been given. And yet why is it they had to manipulate for what God had already said was theirs? But they had to find a way. Anybody know what it's like just to help God out with it? Just like, let me like, I don't see you doing it. So listen, I know you're just like, you're, you're really, you're busy. You got a lot going. And this is how I see this coming down. And so they kept trying to steal. So often, um, brothers and sisters, we are trying to steal what God has already given us. We're trying to take something of the spirit by fleshly means. And it, it never works. It never works. I, I want I want to just tell you, I want to just welcome you to the book of geniuses. Because honestly, we get into this book and go, you know what? My family is not altogether different from the family of promise on the early pages of Genesis. I want you to just wonder with me today, how, how many of you would say you're in a mess? I mean, would anybody, I just, it'd just be good to just see a few hands. Just want, go, go ahead because like, nobody's even watching you. Or maybe, <laughs> maybe who's with you, maybe you know a mess and you're going. <laughs> 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 
Or maybe you could say like me, you just like are your biggest mess. Anybody? I mean, I am the biggest mess I've got. But here's what's going to happen over our coming series. God is going to mess with our mess. Oh, yes, he is. Oh, he is going to get into it with us. And he's going to come right into the mess that is us, right into the mess that is around us. And he is going to mess with our mess. Somebody say, Jesus is going to mess with my mess. Jesus is going to mess with my mess. And he's going to mess with your mess. And it's going to be straighter once he gets done with it. I, I love this little excerpt out of a, a commentary. It's a, it's a Jewish commentary on Genesis called The Beginning of Wisdom. And he says this, one of the deepest problems inherent in all family life. The tension between family of origin and family of perpetuation, anybody? Or more generally, between the claims of the past and the claims of the future. Nothing like trying to get your family of origin to fully get along with your family of of perpetuation, the one that God is growing now. If you're like me, when you try, especially when you're trying to get the in-laws with your original family, it's kind of like, you know what? Uh, When somebody's going, let's all have Christmas together, I'm going, let's not. (laughs) Anybody know what I'm saying? I I love you both. Can we have one for lunch and one for supper? Because... It's just a lot to put them all together because somehow the demands of the past and the demands of the future, this tension, I have lived in a, in a, a fair amount of tension between the demands of my family of origin. I would say a very fair amount of tension between the demands of a family of origin and the demands of my own family underneath my own roof. Anybody else? And so some of that tension, I want you to kind of sit in that and feel the in-between of the claims of the past and the claims of the future because so often there's something back there that still is having present effects of past situation, uh, something we regret terribly of our youth, and we're living with it in our present. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody been there besides me? Listen, uh, uh, about a month ago, I arrived in Moline, Illinois, uh, for a Living Proof Live. I was so thrilled to get there, um, about an hour's flight outside of Chicago. It's John Deere country. It's, the, it's where the headquarters of John Deere is. I don't think I didn't take every one of my pictures off of our equipment that we actually do really like real life own uh, because we live in the backwoods of nowhere but we had the best time in Moline Illinois but when I got off the plane and was walking through the airport uh, there were some people that were waiting on other people to get off and there was a woman with a, a tattoo sleeve now I'm not talking about I, I've always kind of I've always thought you know in a different life I probably would have gotten tattoos I'm not I'm not talking about that so I don't nobody get any con, uh, condemnation on you I, I can think it's darling but this was the sleeve anybody this was the full sleeve and um it really looks good at about uh, 25 and 30. But only the woman was, I'd give her right under 70. And it's like, whoa, wowzer. Because to be honest with you, I could no longer tell exactly what the original design was. That's the thing. And so sometimes we got our sleeve tattoo and it seemed like such a great idea at the time, but I don't know, we get to be 70 and it's like, whoa, girl, what, what, where's my long sleeve shirt? <laughs> so we're going to be looking into that. I, I love where it says Jacob went on his way. And the very first of that first verse went on his way because he's thinking he's going his way and suddenly finds himself on a journey going God's way about to deal with something he could not have even begun to imagine. I want you to see with me, I I, I want you to build our entire series upon this very first point because I am asking God to do a lifelong work that we be able to look back to this series and this season in our lives and say, you know what? God did something in me. He rendered something in me through that, that has continued to have ongoing harvest. I want it to be that kind of thing because listen, this got to me. Uh, What I bring you here has already gotten to me. I don't bring that. When I study it out and it doesn't crawl all over me, I don't bother bringing it to you. I bring you what crawls on me in case it's going to crawl on you. And this one crawled on me. And number one is this. It's time we became more honest versions of ourselves. It is time 
girlfriend. It is time, guy friend, that we became more honest versions of ourselves. Anybody already taking a deep breath? Because here's what I hope to prove to you. Every one of us have an inner Jacob. Every one of us do. And we're going to deal with that thing. We're going to look our own Jacobness inside our own selves squarely in the face. We're going to deal with our inner Jacob because until it is intentionally slain, and the thing I find about it is it keeps wanting to resurrect. So it has to be just like beaten down and slaughtered over and over again. And so if you've never really dealt with your inner Jacob intentionally, you've not dealt with your inner Jacob because it does, he doesn't go down like that. He doesn't just go down easy. And by that, what I'm talking about is not um, some, uh, some really, really freaky mystical thing. I just mean that all of us have like a trickster in us. And we'll, we'll work on how that applies to us as we go through the series. But we're going to look at that. We're going to deal with our inner Jacob. Uh, his very name means supplanter. His name means heel grabber. His name means deceiver. And we're going to look at how that applies to us. Even when we think, you know what, but I'm a really honest person. We're going to find out just how manipulative a person we could have inside of us if we're willing to. Now, we can just stay in our denial, but I want God to deal. Anybody else? I mean, I want God to deal with me. I got to tell you, I'm Keith here recently, Keith and I are in our, mid, our mid-50s, and he decided here recently that he was just going to go from glasses to contacts. Now, I've worn contacts for many years, but it's something else in your mid-50s when you're getting used to wearing contacts because if you do indeed get them in, then, you know, you could see Jesus before you get them out. You know, <laughs> Just, uh, you know, it just, uh, it sounds easy, but there's just nothing natural about putting your finger toward the apple of your eye and keeping your eye open. It's just, it, it's been so long now, I don't really remember it well, but when he started doing it, and I was trying to help him, I, there's nothing like trying to help someone get their contacts in and out. I mean, I'm just right in his face, and you don't want this nose right in your face. And so one of the things that has just killed us, uh, he's finally gotten to where he can get them in, and then a lot of drama getting them out, but we can get them in. But all day long, because he's worn glasses for so long, all day long he pushes his forehead like this. (laughs) He'll just talk to you, and then he goes, and and he'll just be talking to you, he'll be looking out, kind of stare at something. (laughs) And I'm just going to tell you all right now, in this present series, over and over, you and I are going to go, <laughs> I mean, oh, this would be me. This would be me. Unless it's just me. I hope I have some company with you. Y'all tell me what number one is because somebody may have just joined us. It's time we did what? It's time we became more honest versions of ourselves. And this is why I'm going to build two right on top of number one because I want you to see them together. We cannot walk in our full birthright as part fraud. No, ma'am. No, sir. We cannot walk in our full birthright as part fraud. It will not work. Anybody? Okay. Our birthright is in the spirit. We are the sons and daughters of God. His very spirit lives in us. The spirit of truth will not invade any part of us that is deceptive. It will not. They don't mix together. It will not intermingle. It will not just go in and kind of take over that part. It won't go there. The spirit of truth will not go into whatever limb, picture it as a limb if you want to, whatever limb we got our game going, Holy Spirit's not in that. So we here we have been called to walk in our full birthright. Because this whole entire narrative is all about birthright. Here we've been called to walk in the full thing in victory. Not just as overcomers. As more than overcomers. As overcoming overcomers. That's what. But we cannot do that with any part of us that is still Fraud. There is, God is going to be calling out to us through this series, come out, come out, wherever you are, wherever that fraud is, come out. Because when we out-talk our true walk, we will trip 
over and over and over again, and this is what is happening. We, our mouth keeps overshooting our true walk. Our mouth, if we're spiritual people, we talk a bigger talk than our walk is living out. But for every one of us, I've said this so many times on Wednesdays, for every one of us, the way we're walking is the obvious, the true determining factor of our belief system, not what we're saying. It's how we're living, what we're, what we're stepping out in. Genesis 27, I want to read verses 41 through 42. Um, now, this is when Isaac, uh, the father, has blessed Jacob with Esau's blessing. Jacob has, uh, honestly, because Esau was the hairy one, he has put skins over his arms because his father has gone blind with age. He has pretended to be him. What's so interesting is that Isaac keeps going, are you sure you don't, you don't sound like yourself? Sometimes we need to go with our gut. You know what I'm saying? Like, this doesn't seem right, but okay. You smell right. You feel, which means he smells earthy, like an animal. And, and you feel right. It's, it's got to be you. So he gives him that blessing of the firstborn. This comes on right after when Esau goes and says, is there anything you've got left? And what he's got left, it's like Esau's going like, that's a blessing? Are you telling me that's a blessing? How can you call that a blessing? Now, pick up at 41. Now, Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are approaching, and then I will kill my brother Jacob. But the words of Esau, her older son, were told to Rebekah. So she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said to him, behold, your brother Esau comforts himself about you by planning to kill you. Ooh. I don't know what version you have, and I don't know how it says it, but is that troubling? Now, your brother Esau comforts himself. Listen, there is nothing in our lives that conveys our emotional health like the means by which you and I comfort ourselves. You can take that one to the emotional bank. That whatever it is, when we are feeling um, badly, when we're feeling done wrong, when we're feeling rejected, when we're feeling betrayed, when we're feeling overlooked, when we're just feeling empty, that whatever it is we turn to to comfort ourselves, nothing conveys our emotional health like that. What is it? I mean, this, this was for Esau uh, is planning vengeance. He would replay and replay and replay the wrong that had been done to him. And that's how he comforted himself. It's how he was going to get back at him. It's, it's all sorts of different things for the rest of us, perhaps. But it shows exactly the same lack of emotional health when we turn to something so destructive to comfort ourselves. For, for Jacob, the threat was real. He'd not made it up. Sometimes I just flat make up a threat. Anybody else? I just make something up. If there's not something really bad going on, I'll think of something. Like if I'm not anxious about something, in my natural personality, I'm just given to anxiousness and anxiety. If, I, if I'm not um, anxious about something, I think, well, there should be something. Because I'll, I'll miss it in my own heart. I think, okay, this, 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 this feels weird. I feel at peace. Anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Like, this can't be right. This can't be me. Look in the mirror. Could that be me? That cannot possibly be me. And so this is what we do. Then we just, we work something up. This is not what he did. This threat was real. Now, I want you to watch a sublime moment in Jacob's life because you've already seen. He said, okay, I know I'm going to have to face my brother. I'm going to send these people on to him. I'm going to get them to say the following things. And then they came back. They said, oh, we met up with your brother. All right. I'm back in 32 now. We met your brother. All right. He's coming. He's got 400 men with him why on earth Jacob would have to ask himself would he come with 400 men if he meant no harm why why and so he gets very distressed and I want you to watch what his first response is because it's just incredibly awesome it's the first prayer we see of Jacob we see him respond to God like um when he had had the uh dream and and then he said this God is awesome in this place but we've never seen him outrightly in prayer until right now and it is a big one he says this Oh, God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, oh, Lord, who said to me, return to your country and to your kindred that I may do you good. I am not worthy of the least of all of the deeds of steadfast love and all the faithfulness you have shown to your servant. 
For with only my staff, I crossed the Jordan. Now, that doesn't mean your secretary. That doesn't mean Siri on your phone. That doesn't mean anyone who works with you. This means a stick. I crossed over this place with nothing but a staff in my hand, a stick, a walking stick in my hand. And now I have become two camps. Verse 11, please deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him that he may come and attack me and the mothers of my children. He said, but Lord, you said I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. I want you to notice how he is reminding God of his promises. This is what you said to me. And I mean, this is exactly, we'll see this kind of prayer over and over. We see it in Moses. Um, we see Abraham do it. We see David do it over and over again. We see some of the kings of Israel and Judah do it when they come before him and say, your word says this. This was the promise you made to me. And Lord, I'm standing on that promise because this is what you said. I love how it says, you promised to do me good. You pro do you believe, I mean, at the end of the day, in the black of the night, do you honestly believe God has promised to do you good? I mean, do, when, when nobody else is there, do we really believe our God will do us good? Did he not promise over us? Listen, Paul said, I being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work, if I say good work, We'll be faithful to complete it. You and I, if you just, listen, if you want to do a wonderful word study, go look on your Bible gateway or any other search engine for the scriptures in that concordance where you can do a word search. Bring up the word good and you look at all the times God promises to do his people. What's the word? He promises to do us good. He has promised even in our most disastrous seasons that he will even work those for good if we love him and are called according to his purpose. That's Romans 8, 28. I will do you good. I will work it for good. So here Jacob comes and he reminds God of that promise. I, I think it's so interesting. Let's, we know the story, many of us, so well that we pass over it easily. I don't miss the fact that he said, um, save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother. Um, I wonder how many of us would say that the biggest threat we feel is from someone we are fully related to. Isn't that strange? That in a situation where we ought to be most protected, we feel most at risk. Uh, many of you who come from a, a sexual abuse background like I do, for most of you, it wasn't by a stranger. It was by somebody you should have been able to trust. And I, I love how Jacob says to God, I love the, the gut honesty of it. I'm scared of him, that he will hurt me and hurt my family. Listen, there's something to be said about the honesty. If you and I are going to become more honest versions of ourselves, and, and we're going to walk in our full rights of sonship and daughtership, uh, and not as any part fraud than to be able to get as honest with God as we possibly can be and go, I'm scared of this person. I mean, every now and then I'll feel like the Holy Spirit is speaking. I mean, what is your problem with them? Not in words like that, but just in my spirit, what is your problem? And sometimes I just want to look back and go, I'm scared of them. I have to keep them back. There is something about that person that scares me. Am I stepping in this with anybody? And it's what we've got here is just bringing it out. So this is profound. I mean, this guy had done exactly what he should have done. He turned to prayer. Verse 13, you cannot appreciate what comes next until you have seen verses 9 through 12, where he prays this awesome, powerful, faith-filled prayer. And then look what happens in 13. So he stayed there that night. Now, some of us know what can happen at night. Like we prayed that prayer. We were strong in the faith. Then we start thinking about it. Now, what if God doesn't come through? And we start planning. This is our contingent plan. We're going to now, I need to come up with plan B. In fact, probably it's going to need to be plan A and B as if God comes through. I mean, think, can we be honest here? Because you and I are trying to die to our fraud through this series. And isn't it true that we're going plan A is what I plan to do. Plan B is if God happens to come through for me. And so his mind just begins, turning out, begins to turn. Now watch what happens. So we stayed there that night. And from what 
he had with him. He took a present for his brother Esau. Oh, I know. I'm going to need to buy his favor. So I'm going to need to get him a present. That's, that's what I'm going to need. I'm going to need to buy him. I'm going to need to buy him so he will not hurt me. I'm gonna, have you ever given a present to somebody you're scared of? Maybe that'll appease them. This is exactly what's happening here. It says, okay. And he took from what he had with him, he took a present. He took and made a present for his brother Esau. When it says present, it's going to say it over and over. It means like a gift that you'd wrap a bow on. Only look at this. Here it goes. This is the present. Verse 14. 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 milking camels and their cows. Now, at first, I read that as 30 milking cows, and then I looked back at the, it doesn't say cows. It says 30 milking camels. Now, I don't know, call me, call me um, dull, call me blonde, but I've never really thought of milking camels before. I, re- I, know, I realize that they'd have to have some milk, but I just really never have thought about milking camels. The whole thought of it, the whole scene of it in my mind, I don't know, something just wrong with it. 30 milking camels and their cows. 40 cows, 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys, and 10 male donkeys. I mean, you, you listen, this is not a puppy in a box with a bow on it. I mean, l- listen to me. I'll do the math for you. That's 550 animals. He's giving as a gift to his brother Esau, who is coming his way with how many men? Somebody tell me. 400 men. Now, I have been with almost that many animals since I have been in this area for this taping. Maybe that's a slight exaggeration, but I love to get to stay with a buddy of mine that is on the staff at LOI and has has worked with James and Betty for many, many, many years. Her name is Janice Meyer, and I wish so much. Wouldn't you know that she would escape where I could not make her come out here? If we're just a moment, well, maybe they'll show a picture of her because she is just a crazy and wonderful wonderful friend to me. Uh, we're an antithesis of one another in many ways. And But let me tell you, we both love the Lord Jesus and we love adventuring him in the weirdest way. And I'm going to tell you, when I get to stay with her and her housemate, Kim, that means I also am just like given to the dogs. And I mean that literally. I want you to see this picture so that you can get what I'm talking about. This is, this is when I checked in with them yesterday. It's what they call, instead of a bed and breakfast, it's kind of like a bed and canine. You understand what I'm talking about? I mean, like, that is a group of dogs, is it not? Now, I just want to, to me, that's a gift, but it isn't necessarily a gift to everyone. But he was hoping that this 550 animals was going to be just the gift to buy Esau off and get his vengeance to quell Now, look at what happens now, because this gets so interesting. Verse 16. Then he handed over to his servant every drove by itself and said to his servants, pass on ahead of me and put a space between drove and drove. Now, he instructed the first, verse 17, when Esau, my brother, comes um, to meet you and asks you, to whom do you belong? Where are you going? And whose are these ahead of you? Then you shall say, they belong to your servant Jacob. They are a present sent to my Lord Esau. Watch the terminology. Your servant, Jacob, this is what they are to say to Esau. You say, this is from your servant, uh, Jacob, to you, uh, his Lord, uh, Esau. And moreover, he is behind us. He's right back there. The present goes first. The appeasing goes first. He likewise instructed the second and the third and all who followed the droves. This, you shall say the same thing to Esau when you find him. So picture this because here comes Esau. He's going to meet each one of these droves and they're all going to say exactly the same thing. And you shall say, moreover, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he thought I may appease him with the present that goes ahead of me. And afterwards I shall see his face and perhaps he will accept me. So the present passed on ahead of him and he stayed that night in the camp. Now here's what I want you to see. I want you to just jot down as we've been thinking over this prayer. And now we're watching this whole contingency plan of Jacob take place. I just want you to write down this little sentence right here. It's not one of your numeral uh, points, just a sentence I want you to write down so we can see where do we tend to fall. Do we pray it then work it versus pray it and obey it? Because you and I have a tendency to do one or the other. Pray it then work it versus pray it and obey it. 
Because what, what I want you to see is that he's not even obeying the prayer he prayed, which is to walk in faith of the good promises of his God. He prayed it all right, but then he began to work it out. Because what he's basically saying is, I've told you to be faithful, but I know you're not going to be. I'm going to have to come in behind this, and I'm going to have to make sure. And it just it struck me so vividly that every independent, not dependent action, every independent action to fix a situation in the life of a child of God is a demonstration of unbelief. Every independent, when we work independently of God to go fix a situation, we are acting in unbelief. Not only that, but God put a strange word on my heart because God placed it upon me that it not only is unbelief, it is also pure laziness, pure spiritual laziness. Because sometimes it takes a whole lot more energy and work to sit back, trust God, and not pick up your hand to fix it. That takes some work, girlfriend. That takes some work. Out of our pure laziness, we'll start fixing the thing. Anybody know what I'm saying? We'll start manipulating. We'll start conniving because it was just too much work to sit back and believe that God would be faithful. Number three is this. We're called to work with people, not to work people. We are called to work with people. But we are being trained by a culture that works people. Now, just so you know what my terminology is, if you're in a different region of the world or in a different part of the country where they don't say it that way, what I'm talking about by working people is not that you're an employer. That's a beautiful thing. I'm talking about manipulating people, just working them. And so working with them. We, listen, listen, listen. We are the people of God. No matter how much the rest of the world works people, we must stop. We are out of the will of God when we just join in with them because our entire culture is all about working people, working people, working people, working people. We're all Jacobing in our own way. I want you to write down two words somewhere in your margin there. I want you to write down the words working people, working people. And this does not mean that we're just like hard working people. No, working people. I want you to write down those two words. Then I want you to put between those two words a little V like that that shows where you're slipping in a word in between. And I want you to put the word with. Because listen, girlfriend and guy friend, we're getting our with back in our working people. Because we are called over and over again. The word of God trains us all through Proverbs. So many of the epistles train us how to work with people. But our entire culture. And listen, you're indoctrinated in it constantly. Through TV programs, through social networking. Social networking is one of the biggest things I'm talking about here. We've got to understand that manipulation is a form of deception. Listen, we, we think that if there is a godly result, it doesn't matter if there has to be a little bit of a man, manipulative means to it. And that's wrong. Because if it's part fraud, the spirit of truth will not be in it. So as as people of God, we can't say, well, the the end justifies the means. Oh, no, it does not. God never uses carnal, worldly, or manipulative or controlling means to bring to a godly end. That is not the way he works. And we are held accountable by him no matter how much the rest of the world is getting away with it. And trust me, they are. Listen, one of the things that I can use that can help me figure out if I'm working with people or working people, I have to ask myself a couple of questions. And so I'm just going to pitch some out to you if this helps you. This is what I'm going to do. Because sometimes it's a fine line. Would anybody agree with that? Like, at what point did I cross over that line where I, I began to work them? Because especially people that are real people, people. I mean, we can work people. At what point are we crossing over that line? Okay, here's two questions I ask myself. First, what's in it for me? What's in it for me? Now, in a business situation, you're trying to get your staff uh, really motivated. Okay, 
say there's bonuses involved, whatever. Okay, sometimes there really is something in it for you. But you can know in advance, at least if there is something in it for you, uh, you can know in advance, okay, I'm already on thin ice then. This already means because there is something at stake in this for me. There is something personal I could get out of what it is I'm trying uh, to convince people to do. Okay, then I need to know already I am standing on very, very thin ice. I better be extremely aware that I'm walking in wisdom here, but I got to ask myself, what is in it for me? Is it a self-oriented goal? I'm um, getting what I want from them. The second one is this, and I've really been testing this. I, I'm trying to think about two weeks ago, God began working this lesson in my heart and I've thought about it ever since. And I mean, every day since then I've thought about it and I've just been dealing with whatever because I'll just go in, in my own spirit, fraud, fraud. And I want you to, I don't want that to scare you. I, my husband, I believe my husband would tell you he knows the same woman that, that you have serving you today. But you know, when we just kind of, I mean, I'm Southern. I'm going to say just a little bit more than was necessary. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say, I'm going to tell you, I love you just a little bit more than I do. I mean, I love you a little, but I'm not going to say I love you a little. I'm going to say, you are my best friend forever. When you're not. You know what I'm saying? When somebody said, like, do you know what my name is? Well, no, now remind me. Or remind me because it's on the tip of my tongue. Anybody know what I'm talking Somebody, somebody, somebody. So the second question is this. Is there a single slice of insincerity in it? A single slice of insincerity. Even if it's well hidden. Even if they'll never know it. But here's what's been happening. Because I'll hear myself. Because I see people all the time. Talk to people all the time. And I've begun to get this thing because I've been asking God, deal with me on this. That when I say something that just has a slice, a slice. I can't tell you how many things I've said again in a different way over the last two weeks because I think, say it again. This time, say it more honestly. I, I think about you all the time. Well, you know, day before yesterday, it was really occurring to me what you're going, no, not all the time. <laughs> but I have been thinking of you. I prayed for you so many times. Well, I prayed for you three times, but I did it with everything in me. You know what I'm saying? What, what is the source of insincerity there? Now, listen, you and I live in a social networking world. And I'm, when you see the word social networking, I, working. I mean, they are working it. We are working it. Here's the deal. I, I want to be part of it. I, I like it. I'm not on Facebook because I don't have time for it. The ministry is, but I'm not personally. But I love blogging. I like Twitter. I, I like all of that kind of stuff. I love fooling with my phone. But I'm just going to tell you, I think there comes a time. Let me just ask you, if you describe someone you know, and when, I mean, she is a networker. He is a networker. Do you really, I mean, I'm just asking you, really, do you mean everything good by that? Because I bet you don't. I bet you don't. I bet you'd laugh just a little bit. Do you know somebody that's just like they're always running for president? <laughs> Anybody? We're just always running for president out there. Because they're networking, 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 networking. I'm just saying we're on thin ice here, believers. We're on thin ice because this world that we're operating in is given to it. I mean, it is just given to it. And so I want you to hear this is way, 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 way before social networking even became a term that we used. A.W. Tozer wrote something, a quote that I want to read to you. It says this, the grosser manifestations of these sins, egotism, exhibitionism, self-promotion, are strangely tolerated in Christian leaders, even in circles of impeccable orthodoxy. Promoting self under the guise of promoting Christ is currently so common as to exact little notice. Exhibitionism, egotism, self-promotion. We're all about, forgive me, if this shoe doesn't fit, don't try to put it on. But I'm just saying, in this social networking world where Christians are just completely immersed, and I'm one of them, if we're not careful, we will use Jesus to promote ourselves. We will use Jesus to get us some followers. Not him. I got this many new followers. This is dangerous. And it is fraudulent, and it is not working with people. 
It is working people. It is working people. I mean, well, listen, we have a mass population of heel grabbers. You might know what I'm talking about, heel grabbers. Jacob was the original heel grabber. When he and his twin brother were born, he was born grabbing on to his brother's heel, grabbing to get ahead. Uh, let, me, let me tell you what can happen. We have people that are so ambitious to be used powerfully of God that they grab the heel of someone they think is being powerfully used by God so that they can use them to get somewhere. Now, listen, there's mentoring where someone comes and takes your hand. I have the joyful privilege of being able to just walk with Priscilla Shire. It's one of the greatest joys of my ministry life is having these, these spiritual daughters. And listen, she was well mentored by several powerful women of God before I ever even came on her radar. But we, we have a close relationship. I've already heard from her this morning praying over this taping. I love her so much. I gladly take her by the hand in any way I possibly can and introduce her to anyone that will even listen to me. But not one time has she tried to grab my heel. Not one time. That's not hand-holding. That's not mentoring. That's not learning by example. That's grabbing on so you can get where they've gotten or get what they've got. And it's dangerous. I thought how the serpent bruised the heel of the seed of Eve and how the enemy has been trying to grab onto the heel to supplant the work of Christ throughout all of human history. You want to see something so freaky here before we close? Uh, look back where it says in verses 20 and 21. Now, let's all think up for a minute because I'm going to have to talk, um, I'm going to have to talk some original language here, but there's a reason why we're doing it, and I want you to uh, appreciate it. And in the scriptures, particularly in Hebrew, there's this thing called narrative art. You don't see it as much in Greek. But in the Hebrew, it's not only what is being said, it's how it's being said. A very often a strong alliteration, very often real poetic language, very, very visual, very artistic language. And it's happening all over the place here. Because in 20 to 21, where Jacob said, you shall say, moreover, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he thought, listen carefully, I may appease him with the presence that goes ahead of me. And afterwards, I shall see his face and perhaps he will accept me. So the presence passed on ahead of him. Him, and he himself stayed that night in the camp. Listen carefully. In the Hebrew, the word panim, which is the word for face, is used five different times in those two verses. If we were reading more literally from um, the Hebrew, it would say, instead of I, I will appease him or I may appease him, it would say, I will cover his face. I will cover his face. When you and I are manipulating someone, it is as if, I wish so much I thought to bring a hand towel with me, because it is as if we are standing in that front of that person and we're covering their face with the towel while we're talking to them. We may even cover their face while we hug them. Anybody know what I'm talking about? We'll, we'll meet with an employer and we'll just throw a towel over their face because we're trying to appease them by manipulation, by spinning it instead of dealing honestly with the situation. I will try to cover his face. It goes on to say, the presence that goes ahead of me, literally it is that presence that goes ahead of my face. In the ESV, it says it clearly, I shall see his face. That one is clear. Perhaps he will accept me. When it says that in the ESV, it says he will raise my face in more literal um, uh, translation of the Hebrew. So the presence passed on ahead of him. In the Hebrew is it passed on ahead of his face. Five times, face it, face it, face it, face it, face it. Do you think Jacob was having to deal with facing it? I think so. I think so. And so that's what's happening. What God wants to do in us is get us to throw in the towel that we keep throwing over somebody else's face to appease them and face it. I say this as one who has been there so many times. Have you made a mess? Girl, I get it. I get it. Guy friend, I get it. I have too. Are you a mess? Oh, I've been one. I've been one. Has there been a mess made? Oh, I know about it. But there comes a time 
when we keep wondering why healing escapes us and we will not do the dealing that would bring the healing. Deal with it. Deal with it. Deal with it. Deal with it. Our very last point is this. Start facing up by going face down. Start facing up by going face down. Today, find a place in your house. Go somewhere where you can be alone. Maybe if you're at your workplace, maybe you need to wait till you get home. Maybe in the public restroom, it would not be as uh, as great a place to try this. But let it begin. If you and I want to begin facing up, okay, I need to face this. I got a situation between a couple of my kids here that nobody's calling out, and it needs to be called out. This is what is going on. I need to take authority in an area where God has given me authority, but I will not stand up and say what it is I see. Anybody know what I'm saying? Is this, we're all just working people, work, and we're letting them work us, and we know we're being worked. Do we need to face up? Then go face down. It starts right there. Go face all the way face down on the ground and go, God, if I can face you, I can face anything. Genesis 32, please be seated. And let's study together. All right, here's what I want to do with you guys. We are going to pick up by reading in verse 22. We're going to read about this scene where Jacob wrestles with the angel, one of the most famous scenes in all of the Old Testament, and one reason why it's still thrilling is because no theologian, no scholar, no pastor, no teacher has ever figured out exactly what is going on in those passages. But here's the deal I've got to make with you. I'm going to make a few comments, but it is not where our lesson settles. We've got to make it at some point in this series into 33. Hold me accountable to that because it's hard not to move ahead. I, I got to tell you, as we get started, I, I want our um, viewers to catch up with us. Maybe they haven't been part of our series so far. And in the series, we've made four points together, and I want you uh, to help me uh, be able to get them up to speed by repeating back what they are. Number one is this. It's time we became a more honest version of ourselves. Number two, we cannot walk in our full birthright as part fraud. Number three, so important, did number three get on anybody but me? It, it says this, we're called to work with people, not, not just to work people. And four is this, we start facing up by going, by going face down. In other words, listen, once we can just face this thing with God, we can get up and we can face a mess that is in our lives without fear, and you're going to see that all over our narrative today. We've been talking about not working people, and let me tell you, um, I would have been a natural-born worker. I just would have been. Anybody with a really sanguine personality that really likes a lot of people, um, they can also just be, I mean, just diplomatic and worky. And I especially, if I could, I would have wanted to work my husband in the worst way. Keith Moore will not be worked, and it, it drives me insane, and it has always driven me insane. With Keith Moore, and this is part of what God has worked in me because of him, and I cannot thank God enough for the work that he's done because Keith cannot stand pretension. I, he cannot bear it. And, I mean, even in our earliest days together, if he ever saw it, like, I mean, he was to be, like, grossed out. He would call it out every single time, which is why it means so much to me that Keith can say to me, go out there. You, you live the real thing. Go out there and do it. Because when he didn't see the real thing, he called it out. For, to Keith, um, an ounce of pretension is worth like a ton of manure. That to <laughs> Keith... It's just unbearable. He cannot stand that. Now, if you're honest with him, he'll love you forever. But if you pretend around him, he gets around people that do, do a lot of religious talk and are real self-righteous. I mean, like he's up and gone. I, if he's even in a service where it's happening, he will get his tail up and walk out of it. It is so embarrassing. And so, listen, I, I've kind of known those were the rules, and it's been good for me, even though it's been frustrating to me. But something happened to me on our 25th wedding anniversary. I, it was like a spirit of pride came upon me. Now, we have ne you've never known any couple um, that would have been uh, less expected to make it. 
I, I say continually. I'll, I, I mean, we'll, I'll know we made it to the next anniversary the day that we do. I praise God. He's been so faithful to us. But we just like, we have had a lot of fireworks in our marriage. Just two very messed up people coming in under the same roof. And so, you know, I, I've, I've known he hates that, but something just came over me. And I mean, it was not even something I normally felt, but I just all at once just felt prideful about some things. And I thought, he's been so lucky to have me. Now, as, where in the world? I know better than that. I know better than that. You know, he's just a little more introverted. He's a little more like he would just never, he, he would have never traveled. And he's been in lots of places of the world. He, you know, he just like he had to live way out of the box because of what he married into. And what he married into was a wreck. That's what I need you to know. But for a few minutes on our 25th wedding anniversary, I forgot that. I don't know why. And so I asked him. We took this big trip. We said our vows again. My girls, my, da- my grown daughters were my attendants. We had the most fun you can imagine. Hell flowers, said our vows. I got to say it like a minute. I mean, I meant it. I, I, what I wanted to say to him to that, that day is I would marry you again. I would marry you all over. I don't want to have to. <laughs> but I would. I would. And so I said to him on the plane, on the way home, I just had to wreck it. On the way home, why? Why? Why, not, why couldn't I just not made it home? On the way home in the plane, I said to him, what would we have done if we hadn't met each other? Now, what I really want to know is what he would have done. <laughs> Because I wanted him to tell me, because he really had, he tells me a lot of times, but he didn't tell me that day it was our 25th anniversary. I wanted to remember forever. I've told him a lot of times too. That day I wanted to hear it. Uh, do you feel lucky that you got me? And listen, he's, he, he could have felt cursed to have me many, 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 many times, but suddenly it came over me. I said, what would you have done if we hadn't met? You know what he said? This is classic Keith Moore. Well, he looks up like this. I guess I'd have married my old girlfriend. <laughs> you put a, I cried. You put a stake in my heart. I mean, you, but, you know, it was just classic Keith because I was going for a compliment. I was trying to work him. He will not be worked. I can tell you that. It's been one of the best things that has ever happened to me. And I, you talk about a man in a mask. He was going like, what did I say? What did I say? He said, wouldn't you have married your old boyfriend? I don't think so. I just was like devastated, just devastated. So we're getting to see this part of ourselves, that, that worker in us. That worker in us. Picking up at 22, the same night, Jacob arose. This is after he'd planned this whole masterful plan of, I'm going to give a big present to my brother Esau, and then he is going to be appeased. I'll throw a towel over his face where he will, and I'm talking about that metaphorically. I'm speaking. I'm going to somehow cover myself where he doesn't see the real me. I'm going to come before him with gifts so he will not kill me because they're about to meet for the first time in 20 years since that vengeance was first born in their hearts over the trickery of Jacob, the little brother. And it says that same night he arose and he took his two wives. Everybody say one too many. many. His two female servants and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. And when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Now, I'm just going to pause because we're just going through. We're just traveling through to make it to a stop in um, Genesis chapter 33. But you got to see this because you got to know what happened. Because when it says that he could not um, prevail against him, it means that he could not make him quit. My grandson Jackson is six and a half years old, and I suppose every little boy loves to wrestle with his daddy. But Curtis, I mean, since he was a little bitty guy, I mean, I'm talking 18 months, two years old, he's loved to wrestle with his daddy. And he would even come to my house, he calls me, my grandmother's name is Bibby, B-I-B-B-Y, and he would come to my house and go, Bibby, wrestle me. I said, you know what, can maybe just tickle your back? You know what I'm saying? Because I'd rather do that. I'm going to leave the wrestling to the men. But Curtis might have used this same word if, if somehow Jackson was in such a mood that he could not get him to quit. 
that he just kept, I mean, it would, it would have gotten Curtis tickled because he'd have gone, this kid's not going to let up. Keep wrestling, keep wrestling, even though he's been beat. Keep wrestling, keep wrestling, keep wrestling. That's the idea of what's going on here because we know that the angel of the Lord here, we know he was all powerful because all he had to do is touch his hip and it popped out of socket. So the whole frame of mind is here is that he kept wrestling with him. He would not let go. He would not quit. And it was the very first honest fight Jacob had ever had. It was so odd because he's just about to face his brother. But first of all, you don't get more face to face with a person than when you're wrestling with them. You're not on their back. You're front to front face to face with someone you're wrestling with. And this huge thing happens in verse 26 when it says, then he said, let me go for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Unless you bless me. You, do you hear Jacob going, I want an honest blessing here. I, I'm just saying, I'm not letting go because you're going to bless me. You have something that I want. I want the blessing on me. I want an honest to good blessing. And we find out in Hosea, if we don't have Hosea to help us with this passage, we miss a wonderful part of it because the book of Hosea describes this scene and it says that Jacob, and I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit in my own words, is crying his eyes out. That's how we know he's not just winning here. He is wrestling with him, crying his eyes out with tears. He says to him, I'm not letting go. I'm going to hang on till you bless me. What a powerful thing, because that's what God has promised to every single one of us, is that even in our hardest times, that if we would just hang on long enough, just hang on, the blessing will come. Somebody's wrestling with God over something, because here's the thing, you can't wrestle with people. If you're a person of faith, if you're a child of God, you cannot wrestle greatly with the person without wrestling with your God. Because we can't separate it out. If I've got a big problem with my husband, if I've got a big problem with um, a sister or brother in Christ, if I've got a big problem with a sibling, if I've got a big problem with an, um, a, a, a co-worker, if I'm in a big situation, then if, if somehow that is not also coming into my relationship with God where I'm wrestling with him over it, somehow I am still in a very childish place where I've got everything in separate compartments. So he's going to wrestle the thing out. He's wrestling with Esau in his mind. Now he's wrestling with God over what to do with Esau and the problem of the blessing. And he's not going to let go until that blessing comes. And some of us say, you know, I went through that whole thing and the blessing never came. Baby girl, baby guy, did you let go? Did you let go before the blessing came? Because, listen, in anything we struggle through, if we'll hang on long enough, I will not let go. I will not let go. I will not let go. I will not let go until this blessing comes. If we'll hang on, that blessing will come. But what happens is this. We let go. We let go. Here's the beautiful part of it because I don't want anybody to feel condemned. Listen, I've been in a place. I, I've sat under teaching where I just felt more and more shamed in myself, more and more foolish because I think I, I did it all wrong. I did it all wrong. But here's the God of redemption because you can grab back on. Did, did you let go too soon? You know what? He's still there. Anybody? I mean, like grab with everything you've got, grab back on. You know what, Lord? I let go over that situation and my blessing never came. And you know what? I'm grabbing back on. Consider me grabbed back on. Because I'm going to see the blessing come out of this thing. If it is the last thing I do, I will not let go unless you bless me. I told you it would be impossible not to teach this portion. I told you that would happen. <laughs> All right. And he says in verse 27, what is your name? This is the angel of the Lord speaking to Jacob. And he said, Jacob. And you know what he's saying because his name means hill grabber, deceiver, supplanter trickster and he's having to say his name now you know that the angel of the lord picked him out because of his name he knows who he's dealing with but he wants jacob to own up to the fraud within him and when he does he will do this with every single one of us when we own up to the fraudulent part of us we start being re named in the heavenlies he said your name shall no longer be called jacob but israel for you have striven with god and with men and you have prevailed and then jacob said to him please tell me your name but he said why is it that you ask my name and right there he blessed him the whole narrative is about the blessing right there he blessed him verse 30 so jacob called the place Peniel for 
for it means, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. Are you a visual person? Do you love this part in a movie where a perfect scene that has no vocabulary with it, just the music in it. It shows now that the sun is rising over the horizon. The sun rose upon Jacob as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. So this is where the big music comes in. I mean, this is the orchestra right here. And it shows Jacob walking off with his limp because he has wrestled face to face with the angel of the Lord. It is huge. And I want to tell you something. It's not just the big moment. It's the big climactic moment of the 20 years. What I want to try to convince you of over the next couple of minutes is that what has been working in Jacob from God has been working for 20 years. God's been up to something for 20 solid years with this man named Jacob. This didn't all just happen at the fort of the Jabbok. This didn't all happen from the day he left Laban. There has been something that God has been after over and over again with Jacob because, stay with me here, he gave Jacob a 20-year look in the mirror because with Laban, Jacob met his match. He met a man that could play a game. And what happened here that I want you to see is giving him a 20-year look in the mirror, a 20-year daily dose of his own medicine. I want you to write this down. Number five is this. Sometimes God brings healing through a taste of our own medicine. Sometimes, oh, it's painful, isn't it? I mean, it it hurts so good, doesn't it? That one hurts so good. Sometimes God brings healing through a taste of our own medicine. Listen, have you ever um, had a revelation happen to you when you realize that what it is you find distasteful about somebody is what is in them that is in you? I hate it. I absolutely hate it. That what you resist is that it forces you to look in the mirror. That what you see in them is a seed of yourself. Uh, that's what you can't stand. And it's this glance at it. I've got to tell you where this has happened to me. And because we're just being honest, this is our series. We're just like being transparent before one another. And unfortunately, I'm the only one doing all the talking. It's time for you to write me and tell me all your honesty. But okay, every now and then... God will cause me to kind of have almost an obsessive stare at a woman who in her attempt to retain youth when youth was no longer possible, she has completely disfigured her face. I'm talking about disfiguring her face. I'm talking about when when you look at somebody and think, what has happened that you can look in the mirror and you think that looks okay. I've got a very, very good uh, dear friend who is a dermatologist. And she said, you cannot know how many times we try to say to a patient, it's not going to look good. I, I, I'm going to ask you. She said every now and then she just goes, I, I'm not, I can't do it. You can have somebody else do it, but I can't do it. Because when you do that, you honestly are not going to any longer look real. I don't mean trying to work with what you've got. I'm not talking about a little nipping and tucking here. I'm talking about a whole restructuring where somebody looks like they've got on this weird mask and they've got all these implants in their face. They no longer have any nose at all. And now, when listen, when your cheeks stick out further than your nose and your profile, something ain't right. Is somebody with me on this? But see, the Lord, I'll, I'll get almost obsessed with it. Like, I can't quit looking at it. Like, if it's in an airport or something or in a restaurant or something, sometimes Keith will go, do I need to sit to the side where you can see better? <laughs> because, because what I know is bothering me is that I think the Holy Spirit is saying to me, don't you, you want to be careful, Beth, don't you? You know, because I want to, you know, work out. I, I, like, I like fun clothes. You know, I want to have cool hip hair. I, you know, where's the line? I don't know. I don't know where it is. Because if somebody argued it with me, I mean, I would say, to, do you color your hair? We wear makeup. 
Most of you guys don't. <laughs> Some of you do. I mean, like, where is the line? Because truly the only way you can know it in the culture that we live in is to walk in the spirit enough to where God can say through his Holy Spirit within you, mm -mm. Right. <laughs> And so the Lord will constantly, when I'm in a situation, I'm looking at someone that's just, just a few years older than me, that has kind of gone bizarre on it. I, I'll hear him say in my inner man, is that what you want? You better be careful, Beth. Stay this side of the line. Lord, will I know where the line is? And so I've got to deal with my daughters. My daughters are, are both uh, in their early 30s. One is 30 and one is 32, and I've got to deal with them. So this is what I want you to do. If mommy ever crosses the line and I no longer look like a normal person, <laughs> if you ever come home and I've got a small nose. And listen, I'm not, listen, I'm not talking about I'm not dogging having a nose job. I, listen, goodness knows I'd have loved to have had one at some point, but by the time I had the money to, I didn't care anymore. Does anybody know what that's not? <laughs> But I, so I'm, I'm not dogging any of that. But I'm, I'm saying just bizarre. When somebody, is anybody, I need to see your hand if you know what I'm talking about. It's just like bizarre, like, whoa. I mean, let me tell you something. By the time, there's this whole big thing that came out a couple of years ago. 60 is sexy. I, I want to tell you something. No, it's not. <laughs> Pick your shirt up because it's really not. You know, pull, you know, it's a lot of things. It's a lot of good things, but no, sexy's not one of them. I can't really even tell you 50 is sexy. I just can't. I, because, you know, it's not what it's about then. But we're trying to be that. It's a little gross. <laughs> and so I asked my, am I telling you all the truth or am I making something up? Is this just me being sensitive or have you seen it? And so I made a deal with my daughters, Amanda and Melissa. I said, here's what I want you to do. If you ever like look at me and go, whoa, where's our mother? I want you to say, mother, we love you so much, but you look like an idiot. That's, what, <laughs> that's all I'm asking. That's all I'm asking. I need somebody. I need somebody. Because see, what we don't like it's just like, like we have to face something that is like a Goliath size of something that is pent up inside of us. And it's scary. Now, I want to read the first three verses of Genesis 33. And I'm relieved and you're relieved because, listen, that was a painful few minutes we just spent, wasn't it? <laughs> was it painful to anybody besides me? I'd love to hear what you men are relating on because there's got to be a way that that relates to you guys as well. Um, Genesis 33, 1 through 3. So here it goes walking off. We've got the sun coming up. The music's really playing loud. It's so powerful. The sun is rising. You can see the sun um, coming up just like purple uh, through, the, through the clouds and through that uh, gorgeous, gorgeous ray of sun uh, coming up. And we see Jacob, and he's limping. And, and a lot of scholars will say there's no reason for us to ever think that he ever got over it. I mean, who was going to, like, pull out his leg? You know what I'm saying? In those days, a lot of times when there was an injury, it just stayed, and it just dogged him until there death and and so in all likelihood um he always kind of had a little bit of an unstable walk and it says and, and jacob lifted up his eyes and look and behold esau was coming and i love this part because it goes ahead and tells us that the 400 men sure enough 400 men were with him and so here's what jacob did now we remember those of us who were in uh, the first half of the series together, we know that he did a lot of conniving and planning. And we're going to see how much he really brings to pass at this point. Because here's what happens. It says that he divides the children among um, the mothers. Here's Leah and Rachel and their children. Here's the servants with them. And he put the servants with their children in front. Then Leah and her children and Rachel and Joseph last of all. But notice something very important here. Verse 3. He himself went on. What is the next word? Ahead, ahead of them. He went before them. Do you remember over and over? Check it out all over Genesis chapter 32. He was saying, and, and Jacob, he's coming behind us. Behind, always hiding behind the cushion us from the person we're not wanting to face. Have you ever needed to really face someone? And not just because it's a biblical command to take another witness, but because you just wanted protection. Take a whole group with you so that that person will be nice to you. Anybody? <laughs> Only this time something's happened. Because this time, Jacob is right out front. Right out front. Because you see, once we've wrestled with God and lived through it, we can face almost anything. Almost anything. 
He's ready to go face him. And what I just love is he faces him. I mean, he walks on ahead of him with his limp, with his limp. And, and you know what occurred to me? You know what? We have all got a limp. We all do. I need you to know I have got a limp. You don't live 55 years on planet Earth unscathed. Hurts happen. Injuries happen. All of us have scars. All of us have wounds. All of us do. Life's tough. It's tough. So we've all got a limp of some kind wrestling through life on planet Earth. But we do our best to hide it. Why? Because I'm going to tell you something. Actually, we're going to see Esau run to him. And I wonder if we could make the point that when we are not so careful to hide our limp and when we want everybody to think we've got it together, we are no longer even approachable. But, but when they can see, I too, I've been injured. I've been hurt. I've been rejected. I've been betrayed. I have been more secure or more insecure than anybody you know. Then that frees them up to approach without their own hiding. I love it. He went ahead of them. And it says something really strange. In verse 3, it says, And he went on before them, bowing himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. So here he comes. Now, picture this because you need to know that, I mean, there's like getting up and getting down seven times, but there's nothing like doing that all with a fresh limp. He's got a, his hip joint is pulled out. So I want you to picture uh, the discomfort that while he's walking toward his brother Esau, he is getting down on the ground and he is bowing seven times. Now, that's so bizarre to us. I mean, if we did that today, people would just be going like, get up. I mean, what are you doing? But in their world, it was what someone would do if they were submitting to someone else. It's how they would show, listen, I come to you as one who is greater than myself. I come to you. I present myself before you with humility. I will present myself before you as inferior to how I see you. So it'd be like somebody would do this before uh, uh, um, their king. Uh, th- this is something that their world understood. But here it's even more fascinating because it is the echo of Isaac's blessing way back in um, Genesis 27 that he thought he was giving to his firstborn son. But he gives it to Jacob instead because Jacob has tricked him and he has dressed up as his brother Esau. But listen to this. He says, may nations bow down before you and your mother's sons bow down before you. So in this demonstration, you're going to see over and over how Jacob is attempting to give back the blessing to his brother Esau. Because once the Lord got hold of him and blessed him, he did not need anything else anybody could give him. Do not miss that. Oh, I'd say so. I'd say so. And he said, you have it. Have it back. So what had been spoken, your brother will bow down before you. He knew that Jacob thought he was, he was saying that over Esau. So Jacob says, I'll bow down. I'll bow down before my brother. And he bowed down before him seven solid times. And it says then, but Esau, I just love this. Verse 4, but Esau ran to meet him. And he embraced him and fell on his neck. And he kissed him and they wept. What in the world? What in the world? What grace. What beauty. We don't know, was this always on Esau's mind? Did he change his mind when he saw Jacob? We have no way of knowing. I'm constantly in a situation, in a narrative, when I want to say, Lord, give me a little more than that. If a woman had written it, we'd, be able, we'd know what, what they smell like. <laughs> we'd know everything about it. We'd know every single detail. What they say to the person standing beside them. What did they look like? What was the expression like? But uh, um, men were inspired to write this, so we're left just going like, what happened there? <laughs> and I want to know, did he plan it? Why were the 400 men with him? What changed when he saw him? What, I mean, why did he need the 400 men if he was just going to run and hug him? I think maybe when he saw him 
Have you ever made a monster out of somebody until you saw them again? You know, you're not near the monster I made you out to be. He just ran to him. After his brother's bowing down like this, runs to him. And he just grabs him and embraces him. He falls on his neck and he just kisses him. And it says that they just begin to weep. And I don't know. I can't even think when that would have been. I would have ever seen face to face two men literally just weep in one another's arms. But it would be a powerful scene. Much more so. I mean, women can do that when they just go like, oh, you're, you look precious. You look darling. I mean, we could do that. But like two men just crying their eyes out. It's so, so powerful what happens in this scene. It says in verse 5, And when Esau lifted up his eyes and saw the women and the children, he said, Who are these with you? And Jacob said, The children whom God has graciously, graciously given to your servant. Do you hear the subservient talk? Then the servants drew near, and they and their children, and bowed down. And Leah likewise and her children bowed down. And the last, Joseph and Rachel drew near. They bowed down. Esau saw the rest of it. He sees all his gifts now, all these servants, all these animals. He says, what do you mean by all this company that I've met? So a, a sweet thing. You know, I have a very um, close connection with women who have taken part in the Bible studies. They will say to me, you probably find this weird, but I, I feel like you're my friend. What they don't know that's even weirder is I feel it too. Sometimes I will feel it in advance. I'll sense that someone has Christ on them. It may not have no familiarity with the studies whatsoever, but I'll just sense the spirit of Christ on somebody before it has ever even come up. And it's just it's, it's a powerful, powerful, powerful thing. And we see this so beautifully as, as they come together in a way that is completely unexpected. And when I meet someone and I, I'll say to them, as I begin to hug them, I'll look around and I'll see their family. Now, who are these? And get down and talk to those children. Reach out and shake her husband's hand. I hug the women and I shake the men's hands. That's what was happening here. He just was looking around going, who are all of these? Who are all of these? Jacob says, they're, they're those that God has graciously given to your servant. And he says, I, I love this because he says, Esau says, what do you mean by all of this? And, and so Jacob answers him in, in verse 8 and says, but I, I want to give them to you so that I might find favor in your sight. And Esau says something powerful in verse 9. But Esau said, I have enough, brother. Keep what you have for yourself. What an unusual thing to be said in our day of excess. When was the last time we just went, I have enough. I just have enough. Please stare into your scriptures. In verse 10, chapter 33 of of Genesis, Jacob said, no, please. If I found favor in your sight, then accept my present from my hand. For I have seen your face, which is like seeing the face of God, and you have accepted me. Have you ever had such a restoration with someone that you knew you were practically staring in the face of God? Have you ever been restored to someone in an impossible situation? I mean, absolutely impossible. Where you're just going like, listen, when I see you, I see God. Because there is no way under heaven you and I could even be speaking. Anybody? It's the wildest moment. Then listen to what he says. Verse 11. Please accept my blessing. Please accept my blessing that is brought to you because God has dealt graciously with me and because I have enough. Thus he urged him and he took it. This, this is so wild because he's called it a present all the way up to now. Boom. All of a sudden in the scriptures he says, take my blessing. Take my, listen, I've come for you to just take the blessing. I want you to have it. I want you to have it. Uh, It's just such a powerful, powerful moment because what is happening here is that we realize this is a major point we want to make before we end up this series together. We know we have grasped the blessing when we keep trying to give it away. We finally, in all of our hill grasping, And all of our heel grabbing, we know we have truly grabbed onto the blessing when we cannot stand to keep it to ourselves. The promise over Abraham is so, so crazy because this is the moment 
when Jacob, after fighting to have this blessing, this is the moment he most had it when he was trying to give it away. Because do you remember the promise that was made over Abraham, his grandfather, when, when God said to him, I will bless you and you and every nation will be blessed because of you. From the very beginning, the blessing of God on our lives was meant to be given away over and over. And we keep it somehow as we give it away. We don't begin to grasp it when we keep it to ourselves. But when we cannot bear to hold on and grasp that blessing, but we constantly, everyone we meet, I want you to have it. I want you to have it. I, I've enjoyed. J Jesus has been my deliverance. He's been my truth in such a lot of deceit. But I want you to have him. His word just thrills me. I'm not, not every day does it stand the hair on the back of my neck uh, straight up. But a lot of days it does. A lot of times I'll just be up early with him in the morning and it will be like I can almost sense his presence right around me. Often enough where I live for it, I'll tell you that. But it's not enough for me to have that. I want you to have it. I want you to have it. I want you to have it. I want you who have been in bondage to know the freedom of Christ Jesus. I want you who have lived a fraudulent past to live in the truth and the honesty of the dignity of Christ. I have received so much, but I'm going to tell you, you know what drives me over and over again? This could only be of God because I don't have one valuable thing in me apart from him. What drives me constantly is that I want you to have it. I want women and men to love the Lord Jesus through the study of his word. It is the driving compulsion of my life. I cannot get over it. We're driven to keep giving it. Here, I want you to have it. I want you to have it. I want. This is what had happened to Jacob. He finally had it. He knew the moment he was trying to give it away. He had it. He had it. He had something that could never be taken from him. Listen, you take it. I brought you the blessing. Esau goes, you know what? I've got enough. But it says he insisted that he take it. He insisted that he take it. And so he did. Anybody happen to notice anything echo to you about a New Testament story in this Old Testament account of Esau running to his brother with the lamp, grabbing hold of him. Whole time Jacob's trying to make excuses. Esau's kissing him on the neck, hugging him, and weeping with gladness over the side of him. And that is the picture of the father of the prodigal. While the prodigal is saying, listen, listen, I don't even deserve to be called your servant. I mean, don't even call me son. All the meanwhile, his daddy is just kissing all over him and going, get the ring, get the cloak, put it on him while we're making all of our excuses, why we don't deserve it, why we don't deserve it. He just keeps putting the sonship and daughtership all over us as people that we would know we are a product of the grace of God and not our own works and not our own doing. Oh, praise you, God. Oh, praise you, God. Sometimes God can just bring a shocking peace to our fiercest wars, can he? Shocking peace. He ever shocked you with peace? Like that should have been so bloody. And there was peace. For that shocking peace with God. We'll just dread like everything owning up to him where all we've been. What happened last Saturday night? Oh, to heck with that. What happened last night? Whatever it may be. We just dread it and we dread it and we dread it. Coming clean with it. Repenting of it. And we don't realize that the moment we come to him in honesty. True confession. And a desire to repent. That in that moment comes a shocking peace. Shocking. That I can't get him to listen to how undeserving I am for him kissing all over my face. So interesting. You know, when I was telling you earlier in the series about narrative art, the word for embrace here when Esau embraced Jacob is only one letter difference from the word from 
and wrestle in chapter 32. When Jacob wrestled with the angel and then when um, Esau embraced him, one letter is different, comes from exactly the same root. One is avok, the other one is havok with a guttural on the front of it. That's as different as it gets. Because see, you see, uh, embracing and wrestling are both forms of intimacy. Make no mistake. Sometimes you're never any closer to Jesus than when you're just wrestling through with him. Just wrestling it through. And then comes the embrace. And somehow after a really big war, very often comes tears. What a beautiful picture of redemption. You want to know what's interesting here? They didn't stay together. They parted. You know, sometimes um, in a situation where God will bring some peace, he, he doesn't mean for you to go marry him. <laughs> Anybody? Sometimes we still go our separate ways. Sometimes there's just been too much water under the bridge. Never with Jesus, but sometimes with people. You, have to, you can only know from God. You've got to find that out from God. But it's interesting because they still settle in two completely different places. But you know what happens? We don't see them together again until their father dies. But you know the gift at their father's funeral? The boys were at peace with one another. They were at peace. It says in Genesis 35, 29, and Isaac breathed his last and he died. And he was gathered to his people old and full of days. And his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. Notice they did not bury each other. <laughs> they just buried their father. They'd come to peace. They'd come to peace. So interesting because, you know, biblically, down through the ages and generations, there became a terrible conflict between these two lines, the line of Esau and the line of Jacob. Don't you find it interesting that the two men themselves had peace, but their descendants fought? Anybody fighting somebody else's battle where they've gotten peace and you're still fighting it? Mothers, fathers, who? we will keep fighting that thing. Some of you have been like me that honestly, like a 12-year-old did your 12-year-old wrong, and here you are an adult, and you honestly hate, you hate a 12-year-old. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Like, because why? Even when they get to be friends, you're like, huh. Oh. They come over to your house like, hmm, I'm just going to be a little bit cold because I remember what you did. Anybody? Anybody? Still fighting the battle when somebody else has gotten their peace. We're still going to fight the battle. This series has been all about becoming a more honest version of ourselves, not trying quite so hard to hide our limp, to lay down our working people for working with people. C.S. Lewis says something in screw tape letters. I, I want to read this to you because it so speaks into what we're talking about. When he talks, and it's when God talks, when God talks of their losing their selves, he means only abandoning the clamor of self-will. Once they have done that, he really gives them back all their personality and boasts that when they are wholly his, and I mean W-H-O-L-L-Y, they will be more themselves than ever. We're so afraid we're going to lose something if we just give ourselves entirely, lose ourselves entirely to the Lord Jesus. We're just going to lose our, we'll have no more personality, no more distinctive features. That is untrue. We will never be more ourselves with the fullness of our personality and the uniqueness of our gifting than when we just wholly give ourselves over to our very faithful, faithful God. I, I started this series several weeks ago by telling you about a story of uh, trying to get Keith to compliment me. Listen, when I'm not trying to um, worm a compliment out of him or work him, he gives them profusely. That is my very honest man's honest way. I'm going to tell you something. I don't know why this story wants um, to make me emotional, but it does, and I don't know exactly what it's tripping off inside of me, but a couple of Sundays ago, um, Keith had gone to shoot in a sporting clays tournament. My man is a master shot. 
and uh, he has practiced and practiced, and the man, I mean, he can destroy him some clay pigeons. And just so you know, these are not real birds. They're just little clay discs that get flown in the air from every conceivable direction. And he has worked himself up through a number of years till he is in what's called the master class. And it means that he only competes against those who are at his same level. So you can imagine the competition and how hard the shoot can be. And so I get a phone call from him, and I know it's a little earlier than I'm expecting him home. It's later in the afternoon on a Sunday. And, and he says to me, Elizabeth, you're not going to believe what I'm about to tell you. And it was out of town, so we had about an hour uh, to drive. And I said, baby, what? And he said, I shot a perfect score. And I said, whoa. You are kidding me. He said, no. He said, baby, I shot a 100. You have to understand, this is 100 clay pigeons coming out of nowhere in a row. 100, and he shot all 100. I mean, I just came unglued on the phone. I was just like, <laughs> unglued. I said, you are kidding me. I said, what? I said, so you won. And he said, well, you're not going to believe this because he competes with men of his same caliber. And so there were a couple of them that had also shot 100, perfect score. So they had to go into a shoot-off. So it went from like three, and then it went to two of them. And Keith and the, the guy, so one of them was going to be the winner. The other one was going to be the first runner-up. Both of them were going to get big trophies. So um, it comes to the third round, and the other guy shoots all five, and Keith misses one and shoots four. But he's still so thrilled because he said, I, I've, got, I've got first place right underneath the winner. I just, I've got first runner-up. And I was just was so thrilled. I was just beside myself, and I said, baby, I said, are you bringing me a trophy? Because I love his trophies. And if somebody beats him, I'm, I'm all up into it. Well, you know, he's got a big gut. I'll come up with something ugly to say about the guy. You know, because I'm all about my husband. You know what I'm saying? Like, I go, oh, you know what? He, I can tell you one thing. He's not near as cute as you. I'll do anything. Because, you know, I'm all about my husband. And I, I said to him, I said, are you bringing me home a trophy? Because I put him out every single time. He says, no. He said, you know what? I didn't wait for it. And I said, why? He said, because I couldn't wait to get home and show you my scorecard. Aww. See, are y'all about to cry on that? <laughs> I started crying to me. I got off the phone, and I mean, I cried, and I cried, and I, I just, because he, that was his trophy. He wanted to come home to his love. This is a man who, as ornery as he is, as much as he wouldn't let me manipulate him, he, he will cup his hands around my face and he will say, life is not worth living to me if you're not in it. You don't know how we fought. You don't know. You don't want you, Don't leave here going, um, I want a marriage like that. Oh, <laughs> you don't. But I'm just going to say um, to him, I mean, the man, I'm his love. And uh, that trophy meant nothing to him. He wanted to walk in the door and go, here's my card. And he wanted his beloved to say, well done. Baby, well good. I did, I cried. I've still got it sitting up. See, when we see Jesus, it's why we're just going to take all the rewards. We're just going to throw them at him. Because we're going, I got enough. I've been blessed by you. I bear your name. And all that's going to matter to us is that our beloved says, well done. And in Beth, in all your flaws, in all your weakness, I present before my father a perfect scorecard. You shot 100, girlfriend, out of 100 because of Jesus Christ, because he shot for me, because he did it for me. Perfect scorecard. The Word of God says he will present us holy and blameless before our God and Father. It doesn't get there, that perfect scorecard. And so forget the crowns. Take the crowns. Crown him with many crowns. All I want is to hear my beloved say, Woo! Well done.